Hello, and you're very welcome along to another RTE Rugby podcast. Neil Tracy here with you this week as we enter a Champions Cup week, round three. All four Irish provinces in action across Europe, Leinster, Munster and Ulster in the Heineken Champions Cup and Connacht taking a brief in the Challenge Cup. Bernard Jackman and Ian Keatley with us this week. Guys, how are you? Happy New Year. You weren't with us with us last week. Good to see you. You too. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Neil. Good to be on. Keith's twenty twenty three started started all right for you last week with with Bose. You got your your first win of the season against against Barnhall in the re rescheduled fixture of the of the AIL. It's obviously the the first full weekend of the new season coming up, or not of twenty twenty three of the the second half of the season coming up this weekend. But nice to get off the mark. No, it was in fairness. We've been we've been threatening. We've got a good few losing bonus points, so it was nice to be on the right end of the scoreline this week. And uh, we actually played Barn Hall again, so it's kind of cool having the the back to back fixture. Um, and we play them away uh, this week, so hopefully we can get two wins in a row, and it'll just kickstart our season. Yeah, and you said as you said the bonus points very very important. Like it's only your first win of the season, but there isn't much of a gap down there at the bottom. Like you're you're right in touch. Yeah, exactly. I think we've had six um, bonus points this season, losing bonus points and try bonus points. So they, they just keep you in touch. Um, and we got the win. So I think we're two points behind uh, Dolphin. And Dolphin are playing Crescent this weekend. And they're uh, second from bottom and third from bottom. So by them playing each other, and if hopefully we can get a win, we can start catching, catching the guys. So it's, it's interesting times, but we just need to look after ourselves first. Yeah, very much to look with that. Um, guys, I might start with um, I might start on Ulster this week. So, beaten by Benetton, 31-29. First time or second time in twenty eight meetings between the sides that that Benetton have beaten Ulster. But Birch, it's it's five defeats and six now for for Ulster, and I I'm still struggling to actually figure out what has happened across these last six games because. Everything seemed pretty rosy in the garden up until 35 minutes into that game against Leinster at the RDS. As time has passed, I know we were struggling for answers that day. As time has passed and as you've watched them over the last few weeks, what have you been able to put your finger on is going wrong up there? I just think their the confidence is rocked and, and it's amazing how one game has, or one period of a game, you know, after that red card, they were actually playing really well for the red card, and then obviously they had the red card. Looked to be in total control, and the manner in which they lost the game seems to have rocked them to the core. And they're just playing without any real confidence now. And I suppose Dan McFarland and the coaching staff would have hoped that that second half revival against La Rochelle would have been a turning point. But I mean, and a win against Connor, so they had little opportunities. You know, a win with a poor enough performance, and then. A bit of a comeback, but without getting um, the win, is normally enough to get a team who are kind of perennial top four team back into action and back into uh, a bit of flow. But no, they're just clutching at, at things. And to lose the game at a dead against Munster, to lose the game at a dead against Benetton, um, will will hit them hard. And um, it's worrying worrying times. And now obviously they've got to go to La Rochelle this weekend and how they how they manage that, which, let's be honest, on paper looks like a a very difficult game. Then back home in Ravenhill, I guess the Sale Sharks. And, and um, we just saw yesterday that their, re- fixtures, their rescheduled fixture against the, the Sharks has now been um, put, in the, put in the calendar. So that will be played. I wasn't really sure how they're going to manage that, whether they're going to be able to find a gap. But that will be played. But, of course, that'll be without the international. So um, what you would have thought was a guaranteed top our home URC position now is starting to look uh, quite rocky. Yeah. And it's, it's incredible the power of, of confidence Ian, because like they looked really, really sharp right up until halfway through that game against Leinster. Yeah. I think the last time I was on, on this, where I think we were talking about Leinster also being the top two teams, obviously in Ireland, but in, in the URC, like I know they're still third in the URC, but yeah, the, the confidence it's, it's it's came from that Leinster game as as Bert said there where they were they were cruising they were in cruise control it's like someone said to them before that match if we win this match we're gonna we're gonna win the URC we're gonna win Europe and if we don't win this match <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna cave and it's it's the power of confidence it's 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 
it's so easily lost. And as I said, it was just a period in that game against Ulster, just 40 minutes. And you can even break that 40 minutes down even to small little margins. And that's the power of the mind. And that's why sports psychologists are, every club should have them. Every player should be going to see one. And even not even every player, every person should see him because it's such a fickle thing, the, the brain. But listen, they, they need it. I can't see them winning in these two European games. I think they're effectively out of the competition unless they get a big upset against La Rochelle. Um, but I think if they do lose this weekend, they should they should just look at going out against Sale and just just trying to get just go out and play rugby because that's what they're good at. But uh, it's it's an amazing, it's crazy turnaround because I, people are asking calling for Dan McFarland's head now and even and I'm like he's done such a great job with them last season and even this season before the the Ulster match. Um, it's 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 amazing. It's and that's why I don't know what that's why we love this sport because it can it can turn. Um, quite quickly on people is it Birch is it kind of an, an overly simplified idea that if they can get to just get to the end of the month and get those I know they'll still be playing the Sharks in February but you know they will have a couple of weeks off in, in that period is like if they can get to February and just hit the reset button do you think that they can in the final third of the season maybe not get back to the level they were at but stabilize things at the very least yeah, you would think so. you would you would expect them to um to get back if you got a bit of a break. They've got the Stormers in Belfast before that break, um. So after Europe, they've got one more URC game, um. And I was really impressed. I know the Stormers lost to Glasgow, but uh, it was a very high quality game, and they're they're a dangerous side. So that's not a given. So I think they can't afford to. I think I think they can't afford to. I suppose just think. Oh, we just. Get to February. I think they need to get points against against the Stormers, um, and and show a bit more form. I, I think what Keats is saying is is one hundred percent correct. You know, Dan's been around long enough to to know the numbers, and they still have a chance of qualifying. Um, but it's it's probably unlikely, and are probably and they're not good enough to to really have, um, or they're not enough form to say you know they're genuine contenders for the Champions Cup. But I think now they need to focus on the URC and to. To be able to be in a good position to beat the Stormers, um, and then go to the Sharks, or even just be in a position mentally and form wise to pick up points later on the season, um, they need to use this two week block as a way of just regaining a little bit of momentum, a little bit of confidence, and um, I'm sure that's what they're going to what they're going to try and do because if they don't, I suppose circle the wagons and 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 show some resilience, La Rochelle could become nasty, you know, and they've La Rochelle have blown away teams down there um, when they don't come um, in, in a good place. So it, it's a worry time for Dan. I think Ian's right. I mean, Dan Dan is being questioned in some quarters, but he, I don't think he should be. Um, you know, he, he the, the, the old street he took over was in a really bad place and they'd just be a turnover coach, turnover coach, whether it's, um, you know, Mark Hanscom, Les Kiss, uh, Doki, um, John Gibbs, uh, and uh, they just need some stability now, um, and uh, just calmly plot their way out of out of the kind of the little the wobble they're in. You mentioned turnover coaches. Now I know he was an assistant rather than head coach, but it, like, does it look like they're missing Jared Payne defensively in that coaching ticket? Have we kind of underplayed the role he's had over the last few years? Yeah, I, I, speaking to some players and um, who've worked under him, um, they they're missing him. They're missing him badly. Um, and the problem is, they've kind of become because they're defensively porous. They've become un, incredibly reliant on their lineup ball, which is a weapon. But when they come up against teams like Sale Sharks or La Rochelle or Leinster, um, it's it's nowhere near as um, as useful as it is against some of the smaller sides. And their attacking game has just Fallen away, um, and when you look back at Ulster over the last couple of years under Payne, um, the attacking game didn't always function, but the defense was decent enough to keep them in games. Whereas now, um, both kind of sides of the ball they're they're floundering, and it's not look at it's not a criticism of Jonathan Bell, but there's certain coaches who just it was easier for Jared because he was a player, um, you know he had a really unique way of of looking at it. He was big into his whole teaming and 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 um getting the, getting the players excited about defense um i'm not saying john bell isn't doing that but 
at the moment there's definitely been a step backwards there and um the pressure's on now. The pressure's on because if you know, Dan, if things don't turn around, we'll have to look at you know the makeup of the staff. Because in Ireland, the reality is in Ireland that you can't change, you know, more than seven or eight players uh, at the end of the season. So um it, whereas in France or England, you know, there's a lot more freedom to to move players on. Whereas in Ulster, you kind of have what you have. You bring in a kitsch off, you might make one or two more signings, but you're looking at your academy or making the players better. So um, I think the pressure's on the assistant coaches as much as Dan. Yeah, and would it be a worry? Like, I know, Ian, we've we've spoken a lot about Ulster squad depth over the last few years, and obviously they're trying to add to it with the likes of Kitchoff coming in. But for plenty of these games over the last six, seven weeks, it hasn't really been a case of, of depth. Like, they've been close to full strength for a lot of these games. They've had their, their big internationals out there. Like, it hasn't been a case that they, you know, they've, they've been having to feel the second string side and the second string side has been coming up short. Like the game against Benetton the other day, there were plenty of first team regulars playing in that match. Yeah, there was. And <clears throat> I kind of, I kind of always worry against uh, Irish teams after those three inter interpro matches around Christmas time, because they are so competitive. You're, you're playing against guys in, in for selection for Ireland, but also obviously there's a lot of hype with the, with the crowd that you want to beat the other provinces. And I always worry about Irish provinces the week after those interpros and then the week just before they play Europe because everyone's building for Europe or Ulster are building for Europe. And there's always that, like Munster didn't play that well against the Lions. We could see Leinster, they struggled against Ospreys. Connacht did well, but it was against, against Sharks' second string team. Um, and Ulster... They, they they obviously struggled. Well, they lost it to Benetton, and there, there is always a worry that, that week before. And yeah, I know what you're saying Ulster have played full strength teams, come uh, nearly full strength teams, and they haven't rotated much. But that's the pressure of losing, and I think that's the pressure of Dan wanting to. Okay, we just need to put our full strength team in here just to, just to get a win, just to get us back on the road, and and. That's probably when you still need to trust your squad because they're going to be quite fatigued now, those players. And they're coming into Europe, as uh, Bert said there, against La Rochelle, who, who aren't going to take any mercy. And if they don't get off to a good start and La Rochelle get that, that jump up and the, the crowd get into it, it could be a long day for those players who are, are obviously fatigued physically, but mentally, I say they're, they are struggling and they need a good win, a good start to get the, get themselves mentally back into that game. Yeah, and like we saw in that first game against La Rochelle, how quickly they can absolutely tear you apart, like 36 0 at half time. Um, mm. Ulster were all over the place, coughing up penalties left, right, and centre, or not 36 0 early in the second half. Um, other final bit on Ulster then as well, like it doesn't rain, it pours. Rob Balakoon's got a hamstring injury, he's out for this week, and just tough for him coming up to the Six Nations as well. But the big one, Birch, uh, they confirmed yesterday, I think we probably suspect it, Marty Moore, torn ACL, like it's such a long-term injury for a player who we've spoken a few times on the podcast in the last 12 months about, about how well he'd been playing. Yeah, it's terrible news for him personally. And um, he had, he is, he's hit a bit of form, you know, even got Andy Farrell back looking at him again, which, you know, I think we all would have doubted or thought his time was over and to get a, an injury like that. The only thing is he's, he's been around the game a, lo a long time and, um, the Irish wanting the Irish model is very strong on his his medical care and, and rehab. So, um, he he'll come back. But just in terms of from an Ulster point of view, from an Irish point of view, and from a personal point of view for him, it's, the timing is is horrible. Yeah, it really is. Uh, best wishes to to Marty from all of us here. We'll move on to Munster guys. Thirty three three win against the Lions and and Ian, you said it there. Like it wasn't. It wasn't fantastic. I think conditions probably played their part in that game. It looked absolutely miserable. Thankfully, I wasn't down in Musgrave Park. I'm I'm going off TV pictures and what I was told, but it looked absolutely bleak down there. But I, I was thinking back to the other time I was in Musgrave Park this season, early on against, against Zebra in the first, I think it was round, round three, when they got their win. And they were absolutely terrible that afternoon. They couldn't string three passes together. And for a lot of the second half on Friday night, while they did make hard work of it at times, there were long phases where forwards were passing the ball in and out and interchanging play. And they certainly looked a world apart from the side that I watched at Musgrave Park a few months ago. 
Yeah, and we've we've kind of briefly talked about with Ulster and and their their confidence and the confidence of sport, and I just think now you've got the Munster team, although they're not still firing on all cylinders, and they're still probably a long way off where they want to go. That confidence is is a bit is back. I think I know they lost to Toulouse and uh, Leinster uh, over that Christmas period, but you can see that they're they're playing decent rugby. They're they're creating a bit more magic. They're not just relying on just pick and goes and they're more like we saw on um we saw uh, the other night against the Lions. Okay, yeah, they, Scott Buckley scored two tries from the mall, but Paddy Patterson scored a nice little uh, try uh, off the back of the rook. He just saw the space. He's not just going through phases. He actually, he, they're, they're looking up now. They're seeing space. Liam Coombe scored another lovely try just from from evading two or three um, <coughs> tackles uh, and, and scoring, scoring decent tries, not just little one-meter uh, pick over the lines with, with Coombs at the end of it or, or Maul. So they're starting to 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 play a bit more elusive rugby, as we say. But as you said, that that win against the Lions, it wasn't perfect. Probably the weather conditions dictated that, but they're playing better rugby, confidence a bit up, and they're starting to actually get a bit of depth into their squad. Mm, yeah, particularly someone you mentioned there, Paddy Patterson at Scrum Half, who was player of the match uh, a couple of weeks back, two tries in two games as well. He's he's had a very, quietly had a very, very good season. Yeah, and we kind of, you always talk about Leinster and how, how they've developed their squad. I think that's what Munster's trying to do now. And yeah, he, Paddy, he, he's doing really well. He's done, he, he got man in the match that night. He's done well when he's come on and he, he, he's, he's elusive. He's electric. He's exciting. He's very kind of similar to to Craig Casey, where he brings that energy, like usually they start Murray and then Craig comes on, but Craig's done well as well. And I wouldn't be surprised if, um, like you kind of look at this weekend, um, you kind of said Northampton are out of it. It's probably a good good opportunity to to give one or two. I know they have to win, but it, it's at home, it's Tongan Park. You think Northampton aren't really going to come over with much. It could be a good opportunity to, to try to throw in one or two of those young players and give them that experience because we know Craig and maybe probably Murray will be gone um, for the Six Nations. So it's a good opportunity to give someone like Paddy Patterson a, a go at this level. First, I was mentioning to you off air before we started. We were down at Thoman Park yesterday. We were all invited, a lot of the media invited down to, to watch Munster train because they've been, the coaches have been telling us for so many months now and the players have been telling us about the, the pace of training and you know, the speed they're trying to work at and they just want to kind of give us all an idea of, of what it is they're doing. And I have to say it was really, really interesting. And they weren't lying when they're saying they're they're training at an incredible rate and an incredible pace. Um, But what struck me, obviously, was the simplicity of it all. And I think a lot of us, when we're, you know, not privy to the fine details of what professional teams are doing, probably overcomplicate things in our heads around game plan but so much of the session we watched yesterday was it was just small simple games where players were working on their skills at a fast rate and forced to make decisions quickly and ultimately it was all very simple but it was just the execution and the speed of it that that brought it to a completely higher level yeah and look to be honest I'd say the the reason Munster struggled early on the season was that transition from a slow structured game to what they're trying to play now, which is a fast, high tempo game, but with some core philosophy. So, you know, the, the game might have been moving fast, but you can be sure that there was core elements and instruction from the coaches that they wanted to implement and perfect. And and probably the coaching happens in the review session probably this morning or when the next day. You know, before they start the day, they look back at some some examples of, of of where they could have, have done things better and learn from that. But in the session itself, it's about high ball and play, high high, um, high meters. And, you know, it's no secret. The, 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 reality, the problem is, sorry, the reason it became such a big talking point for players and coaches was it wasn't happening in the past, you know, and, and that's, the, that's, that, that's the problem. Whereas, you know, if you went to watch a Leinster session three years ago, it would be very similar to, to what you saw yesterday. So Leinster have, and Dan McFarland, to be fair, in Ulster, uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win, um, but it's it's kind of best practice now around how to prepare a team. So Dan would have obviously spent some time at Gregor Townsend, and obviously that's how Glasgow changed, and obviously won a Pro 14. Um, 
that's how Scotland would would prepare. And it actually has been copied from not copied, but it's it's coming from soccer really, just tactical periodization, uh, where the game is at the core of everything you do. Um, and yeah, players enjoy it. It does it does help the skill set because it's not totally drill focused. Um, and you can see it. You know, you Munster in the last two weeks have have had a huge amount of possession. Have looked much more comfortable with ball in hand. Um, have made the Lions and Ulster make a phenomenal amount of tackles. So they've got that possession part right, whereas I think they were probably a, a territory-focused team under Johan, and that's, and that's fine. Um, but uh, And now the next layer is obviously making that possession more fruitful in terms of turning into points. Um, and, you know, and that will come eventually. You know, it will come eventually. But um, at the moment, they, they have to work incredibly hard for the, the scores that they, they're getting. But that, that's fine. And in fairness, I think the team are working incredibly hard, you know, whether it's in, in UL or whether it's on the pitch, you can't fault their effort. No, certainly not. And on the other side of the ball then, defensively, and you're saying like the next step maybe in attack is to to try score from a little bit further out the pitch or or not have to go through so many phases to to get over the line. But on the other side of the ball, defensively, um, the last four games, they've conceded 43 points. So what, just over four po- or just over 10 points per game. And they've conceded four tries across those last four games. Quietly, their their defense has really actually stepped up in the last few months. But we we just talked about there their intensity and training, and I know we talked about the attack side, but they're all they're all skill based games, right? Rugby games. So if they they're practicing their attack at that speed, they're also practicing their defense. So it's it's two sides of the ball. Um. So obviously their attacking game has come on, but that's only going to help you still have to defend the attacking team in training. So that's why your defense is going to get better as well. Um, so I, I've been to a few of their training sessions. They, they always defend both sides of the ball. You've, you've got uh, uh, Prendy, who's, who's watch, constantly watching the attack. You've got, um, you've got Leams, who's watching the D. Then you've got um, Graham Roundtree, and you've got uh, Kiriakou, who's, who are on the breakdown to make sure it's on. And then sometimes they bring in professional referees who... who um, Who'll be looking at discipline and offside, and so they're they're constantly working on their game. So you don't get good at defense if your defi- if your discipline's not good either. So they're not giving teams that that access now um, in. So that's why they're they're not conceding as many as many points. So it's all coming down how, train it, the way you want to play. And I, I was there in Munster. They they've been playing that kick in territory game ever since Axel's been there. So I know you're talking about Johan was there, but they did it again with. Uh, Razi Rasmus and they were doing it since Axel so they've been playing that way for bones of eight years probably more so to change to the way that they're playing now of course they were going to struggle at the start of the season uh, it's a completely different mind frame it's a completely different way, way of playing and I think they're getting the rewards now and Birch the there were those Malcolm Marks rumours over the last few days Dennis Levy poured pretty ice cold water all over them yesterday so that's not going to be happening but Looking ahead long term, like does it feel they do need one or two big front row bodies in there? The scrum obviously struggled big time against the Lions on on Friday night, and I know it was a very young front row for for a lot of that uh for a lot of that game where you had Scott Buckley having to come on early on for for Dermot Barron and Roman Salano is he's you know he's he's got a good bit of game time this season, but obviously he's he's still learning things as well. Like the, John Ryan's going to be leaving at the end of the month. There's a there's a bit of a vacuum of experience in the front row. Yeah, there is. And really worryingly, actually, all four provinces got taken apart at the, at the scrum this weekend. And, and any of us who were, you know, saying, oh, that, that's understandable. You're up against big South Africans. Well, you know, um, Leinster were playing the Ospreys and, uh, and and they got tooled up and, and um, also struggled at times against Benetton. So there was a bit worrying. Look, at our front line... Irish scrum is, is um is more than capable of of holding its own, but just I think there's been a little bit of an issue in terms of depth and and fast tracking some of those youngsters. I'm not fast tracking them, getting them enough game time so they're ready to come in and and, and do a job. And and from Munster point of view, for all the positives, um and and there is lots of positives. You just worry about John Ryan being going back to the to the Chiefs now. Um, you know, probably get away with it against Northampton, but um. You know, if they awaited to lose, it could be could be difficult in, in that area. Um, and I, I think Salano will get there. I think Knox will get there, but uh, they probably could do with 
a little bit of help. And you saw Kilcoyne. I thought, uh, for instance, Wig, Roundtree, he made his substitutions really well um, in terms of being able to stop that scrum becoming a bigger issue than it, than it was. And then look at the lines. The number eight, uh, Chizuka, uh, picking and go picking when a scrum was when they're going about to get a penalty try was madness. But from there, bringing out the coin, um, I, I think helped. And the ref, the scrum didn't become as big of an issue as as it maybe could have been. And, and some favourite refereeing from um, was it Holly Davidson as well, so or Holly uh, helped him. But I think from an um, from a Munster point of view, Salano is the future. He's a good ball carrier, and and looking at recruitment. The challenge probably is, you know, money wise, they're probably tight. Um, someone like Malcolm Marks, you know, even if they wanted him, he he's he's probably the same salary bracket as an RG Snyman, or you know, that's how high it is. If RG Snyman doesn't get back, you know, you couldn't pretend, and they're allowed to keep that money. You could nearly split it across two. You get a very good hooker and a very good uh, prop for for his salary. And I'm not saying that. I think a, a fit RG Snyman offers something, obviously. That they don't have, but um, and then you've got to work with David Nisafora to be allowed to bring in an on Irish qualified player there. Um, so it's uh, we are being very positive about about Munster, and um, but that's maybe an area that's finance or the the license to bring in who they want may make it difficult for them to get to the next level. You know, I think they can be a top four team in URC with the squad they have at the moment, but Munster. Munster's objective is to win, yeah. win silverware, um, and I think they're a little bit shy, shy there. Yeah, and we're talking about bringing players in. Like you can obviously, John Ryan's gone for for six months. Stephen Archer's, he's I think he's his contract's up at the end of the season. So did they bring him in? And then if, if Archie's gone and John Ryan's gone, they're actually going to have to bring in two tight head props. I know yeah. uh, Solomon and Keenan Knox, but. They're still in that development stage, and you couldn't rely them on like if Munster want to go and, and win, win trophies, get to semi-finals, finals. Those lads are still very young in their 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 career. Like you can't depend on you can't depend on them. So you probably need to look at signing Archie back on for another season, or bringing John Ryan back after his stint in um, things. So that means John Ryan's gone, come back, gone, come back. So but. They'll need to bring. They'll need to re-sign either John Ryan or keep Archie on and bring in another, um, thing. So I don't think they'll have the money to sign someone like Ma- Malcolm Marks. And I know you have, you've got um Noah Scannell there, and I know he's not like Dan Sheehan or like he's not the most expl- explosive player, right? And that's what we're looking for. But he still does his bread or but bread, uh, bread and butter. The, the the easy things, right? His his line out is, is is very functional. He's a good, solid scrummager. And I say they're like, right, I think we really need to get in two tight head props here for next season. I think that's where the the gap is that that Munster need for next year. Yeah, interesting to see what they do over the, the next few months. Um might just touch on on Ben Healy, because this time last week when when we were recording the podcast, it was we were talking about him potentially potentially leaving within about 30 minutes of recording the podcast. It was announced he officially is gone. So I might just just very briefly come back to it. Keely, though, as a as an out half, if you were to put yourself in in his shoes, realistically, it probably feels like the the coaching staff have Joey Carberry and Jack Crowley ahead of him at the moment from an Irish point of view. If if you're him, you're probably thinking, okay, I'm not really getting a look in here, and there's a a long queue to go along with it. Can you understand the the decision he's made here? Yeah, a hundred percent. Like, okay, look at Munster. He's kind of he was he was uh, competing against Joey last year. I know a few people were going like, here, Ben's Ben's pushing on now, but you could see at the start of the season they started to go with Joey and, and Jack. Jack was on the Emerging Ireland tour, so then I say Ben's here. Okay, Jack's gone ahead of me and in Ireland and, and probably Munster now. So I say Ben's like, am I going to play? Okay. First of all, he wants, you need to get starting for Munster. Uh, and he's like, am I even going to play for, for Ireland here at this level? He's probably looking at the pecking order in Ireland going, geez, am I fifth, sixth choice here? If I, and you could see he, he only signed one year contracts as well. Mm-hmm. So he kind of had it on the back of his mind. He could play for Scotland. So, so obviously with Munster wise, he's kind of thinking, okay, I'm third choice, but also internationally, He's got a great chance now of probably being second, third choice for Scotland. There's a World Cup next year. He could potentially go to a World Cup. I'm sure 
the the Scottish Rugby Union are, are, are giving them good money to go over. So it just ticks a lot more boxes. Now, don't get me wrong, you still want to play for your for your home and your province um, that he's grown up in. He, he would have dreamed of playing for Munster. But then there comes that reality is like, OK, I've got a good chance to make a, a good career here. I get to play international rugby for Scotland, go to a World Cup. Um, and, and set up a nice a nice career for him there over in Scotland. And Birch, I obviously I don't really know when the the contract was officially signed. Or you know, sometimes these things are done months in advance, and they get announced last week after after a long wait. But would do you think the fact that Jack Crowley was brought on that emerging tour and got drafted in for the for the A's and the and the senior squad over the the Autumn Nation series? Would you think that is probably almost like a a clincher for for Ben Healy? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, he would have been frustrated because opportunities to play for Munster drew, uh, were drawing up. I mean, that contract would have been signed before he played against Ulster and, and obviously he scored a try at the end. Um, so it would have been done probably in November um, or early December when it was obvious that the momentum was with Joey and, 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 and Jack Crowley and, and the Scots would have been watching this. He's obviously one of the players under... On their on their watch list, they tried had a go at him last year. It didn't happen, um, and you know he decided to stay for Munster for another year. Uh, and it's, I think it's a very hard decision for him to make. But I suppose looking at all the um, all the clues that you would need to to basically you know make a decision like that, you would say it's the right decision for him. So he says, I know there's a lot of Munster fans and Irish rugby fans upset and saying, oh, Munster should have done more to keep him or he should have been sent to Ulster or Connacht or whatever. That That's like he's he's a human being who has his own career to choose uh, and to to navigate. And, you know, he's Scottish qualified, um, you know, a, a stronger link to Scotland than, than some of the project players who, who play who play for us that no one really seems to think is an issue. So I don't think I, I think fair play to him. He's, he's made the decision. It's unfortunate um, that Jack for him that Jack Crowley has has come true, um. But I think if you're a betting man now, you 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 say Jack Crowley is more suited to how Munster want to play, um. Has a talent, and you know the Graham Rowntree and Mike Prendergast etc. are are back in the the horse they believe will get him the most um the most wins, and 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 Ben, luckily for him, has not has a really good other option, and he and he's going to take that. So, um. Yeah, I think it makes perfect sense for Ben and, and there's no one to fault here. Yeah, and like from the Munster point of view, as as you said there, there there's naturally there's always people when we see these transfers of people saying Munster should have done should have done more to keep him. But in a situation like this, Ian, where you've got Joey Carberry who's twenty six, twenty seven, Jack Crowley is twenty two, Ben Healy is who's twenty three, like three players with international ambitions who are all in a pretty good age profile. Ultimately, it was going to be really, really hard for Munster to keep all three of those players long-term when they all want to be starting out half for for the province, when they all want to be playing international rugby for Ireland. Keeping all three of those players happy is going to be really, really difficult. I know Leinster in the past have been able to keep that many players in those many positions happy, but at the end of the day, they are potentially challenging for silverware Every single season for for one and two one and two titles each year, it's it's probably a little bit different in that regard. I find it hard to be honest to to put too much blame on Munster in this situation. No, exactly. I'm sure they did. They they tried their best to keep him, but once again, you can't break the bank for for someone who they probably perceive as going to be their third choice. At, at the end of the day, we always forget. Let's it's 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 a business and. Uh, it's always got to got to go down to the bottom line and winning trophies. So and look, we're just five five minutes ago. We're talking about the the need to bring in front row stocks, and we're talking about how Munster split the budget on that. And you know, it'd be it'd be pretty bad of us on the on the flip side to be saying, oh well, they should have just you know thrown a lot more money at Ben Healy. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> there's yeah, you you know yourself. You have to cut make cutbacks somewhere to to get a bit more money for somewhere else. And as we kind of talked about. The, like as much as the Munster fans and everyone in Munster would love to keep Ben Healy, as I said, it's a business and they have to maybe cut back the money from Ben Healy so they can put it invested in in another position that they need to help and that's going to help the overall their overall team and um 
it's unfortunate they have to go, but listen, they're not going to break the bank to, as I said there, for someone who they perceive as as potentially a third choice ten. It just it just doesn't make financial financial sense. And yeah, as we talked about Leinster, they're well able to do it, but it's a big difference when you're winning trophies at the at the at the end of the year. And Leinster are very good at rotating their squad and giving perceived third choice um, players an opportunity with first team players. They're very good at rotating the squad and and uh, keeping guys well, uh, well well in touch of, of game time. Another, it's a very, it's, yeah, sorry, just to finish on this, it's a very unique situation in Irish rugby because I agree, Keith, Leinster are brilliant at rotating them and, and guys seem to be happy to stay to to maybe only play some of the lesser games. Um, but and Neo's good at giving them enough big games. So I think if someone Scott Penny, he got to play in that, in a, you know, our Leinster Munster game in Tom Park in front of 26,000 people, etc. But the what makes this unique is the player in question is qualified to play for another tier one country. Um, and that's that's the game changer. You know, he hasn't gone and played to, to sign for, you know, for Agen or Breve or, or Newcastle just, just to play rugby on a weekly basis. He actually is qualified to play for Scotland and may go to a World Cup with them uh, or may play in, may feature in the Six Nations. So that's, that's why it's something that we haven't seen much of before. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's worth knowing that that changes the whole picture and uh, one cap for Ireland you know takes that, that dream away or that avenue away and um, I think it's, it's it's a unique situation but uh, I think uh, it makes sense for me for uh, for all parties I'm looking yeah. forward to see if he plays for Scotland and Six Nations oh, yeah. do you think I, do you think they'll pick him I, they, they should if they want to think about him if he's going to be yeah. there next year does a World Cup I say Gregor wants to get him in in and around the around the environment. Yeah, look, it's I don't think it'd be outlandish to pick him in an extended squad, mm-hmm. show um, I suppose show him that they are genuine looking at him, uh, and obviously then if if he fits in really really well or there's any injuries, maybe play in the Six Nations. But um, I think he will be involved in Scottish squads before the World Cup. It's just can he do enough to get in for the World Cup? And then you've got Joey, Jack, then Ben all gone on international duty. And then you're looking, okay, who's there in Munster there now? You've probably got Roy Scannell and uh, young Tony Butler. So <laughs> it's amazing how opportunities come for for other players then. Yeah, certainly is. Um, very, very quickly, one other transfer, and it probably leads us from Munster to Connacht's Birch, is um, Mossy Lawler heading heading back home at the end of the season from Connacht to Munster as as skills coach. For people who who aren't hugely familiar with with Mossy's work as a coach, obviously, a lot of people know he was an ex Munster player as well. But what is what has he done at Connacht over the last few years, and what do you think he's going to bring to Munster? Yeah, look, he, he, himself and Collie Tucker, obviously, um, I don't know what, what, for what reason, but they, they there wasn't an opportunity for them, as far as I know, in Munster at the time. They went to Connacht, went into academy jobs, earned their stripes, um, and both got promoted to the to the senior team. So. They've developed like Leamy and Prendergast to a certain extent. It kind of follows that, you know, that pattern of local lads who've who've gone away, uh, had different experiences, built up their CV, and have come back. And um, you know, my understanding is that Mossy was family were still living in Limerick. He was he was commuting, um, and the draw of home is is huge. So I'm Munster, um, I, I've been critical of Munster for uh, being one of the few professional organisations in rugby, the elite teams in rugby that didn't have a skills coach for a while or, or you know, um, named a skills coach. There might have been someone else doing it. But a guy who's, who's so, a guy or woman whose sole job is to, is to work with individuals on, on improving their skill set. And um, I think that's probably another reason why it took a little bit of a little while for, for this attacking shape to, to take place because uh, as Keith said, some of the balls they were dropping, um, you know, a bigger belief earlier on in the year and, and it really shocked you that um some of the skill set was that poor. And I know maybe that was magnified by the chance time the fact they were playing faster, but um I just think it makes perfect sense to have somebody and also if you can get somebody who's been at that pro level. Um and it's actually the opposite of Leamy because Leamy's job was 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 kind of floating between transition players and academy and, and the senior squad doing individual work. Um, and he got the defense coach job and then Mossy's had been promoted to the senior squad and now is coming back to to just do do the skills. He's actually doing a bigger role um in Connacht, but but that's uh 
that's great for for Munster to have somebody who really understands you know what Mike Prendergast is trying to do when he speaks about you know improving their strike plays because he's the one who designed that for a while in Connacht and then being able to I suppose work with players to uh, improve their skill set to be able to execute it so um, great for Munster great for Mossy um, and, and good business I think yeah He's someone you're familiar with have you worked with him much before Ian? Uh, no I haven't worked with him but when I was finishing up in Glasgow um, I actually was chatting to Mossy he was still in Connacht and I he got promoted from the Connacht job up to um to the attack coach in Connacht, and I was actually chatting to him, and he's actually a lovely, he's just a lovely guy to talk to, and he was very helpful to me about about how I can go from a player, uh, from go come from a player career into a coaching career. So he's he's helped me quite a lot, just just little chats about what I need to work on to to improve my um, resume of, as a coach, and uh, he's he he's done his time. He's well Connacht for six eight years. And uh, I think it's great that there's monster player, there's monster ex players coming back to to coach Munster and and they have that passion for Munster. As I said, his family's here. There's not there's nothing better when you're you're playing your family's in in the province and you're 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 really devoted to to the province because you, your family's here and that's what you want. That's why you always play rugby. So you want to you want to do it for your family and, and and your friends and you probably you get more you've got that emotional connection to a club so I think it's great that they've brought back the likes of Liam E. Prendy um, and now Mossy On um on Connacht as well Birch 24-12 win against the Sharks on, on Saturday bonus point win as well which is hugely valuable for them Um, there's an asterisk obviously beside the Sharks because it was it was a shadow team and it was their Curry Cup coach who was over there like they they left pretty much all the all the front liners behind but we've spoken a lot this season about Connacht struggles in attack, even when you consider the opposition. And to be honest, I would throw the conditions into the mix as well. I was in Galway. It was an absolutely dreadful night, just like it was in Friday in Musgrave Park. But that felt a, lo- a lot more like it from Connacht in terms of the, the intent, at the very least, of the attack. Yeah, absolutely. No, they, um, I, I think that would bring them on leaps and bounds. And sometimes you need a little bit of luck in terms of the opposition, whether that's selection or just not turning up to to kickstart things and um you know they were good at that they lost that Ulster game. We know they probably should could have got a draw at the end, but they didn't really fire and there was an opportunity there. And and I think if they had a speaking to them, if they had a beaten Ulster and obviously after the Sharks game, they kind of felt they were where they needed to be, if you know what I mean, because of the the way the fixture list looks like on paper it's much harder pre Christmas for them. So they're only really one win away from um and they got uh, they got a bonus point in that game so they're only one, um, one win away from two or three points away from where they probably felt they should be and to give themselves a possible chance at top eight and they don't have the, the distraction or the pressure of a Champions Cup this weekend or next weekend um, and as, as you said there's there's enough bright sparks in their attack particularly their first phase strike attack I thought the, the scrum play um, for Carl Ford's try with the chip from Mac Hansen was was really smart. Um, with two players going out the back just to, uh, to bring up the outside defense and then find that space. Execution of the kick was brilliant. Support play, um, was was really good as well. The forwards got him, uh, got a top in a mall. Um, and there was another lovely strike play which he didn't score from. Was called back from a from a, a forward pass. Yeah, or knock on. Um, where they just, you could see that they were, they knew Van Reswer would would jump. And you know they had a late sweep, um, to exploit that. So that'll that'll come again. And I was I was kind of worried about it. they brought in a four G pitch to I suppose highlight or to strengthen their attacking game, and, and it just hadn't happened. But hopefully now, um, that's the game that's the turning point for them, and and, and they can kick on. Someone Birch mentioned mentioned there, Keats Carl Ford was was really really impressive. Hasn't played too much for them, and you know over the over the last year or so, just trying to work his way into the team but versatile player out half on a centre he was centre at the weekend I I was back at the sports ground as well literally last January the, fir- the first round before the or the last round before the Six Nations started and Connacht were terrible they were battered by Glasgow that day and Ford started at a half and to be honest he was probably the one bright spark of that entire afternoon but we hadn't seen too much of him since then but he's got a few games now in the in the last few weeks 
took his two tries really, really well at the weekend and just looked very, very assured in the centre. Yeah, uh, yeah, he did. And you know what? The comments struggling. I, like Jack Carthy's kind of been struggling a bit, bit this year, and maybe that's why they've started to to throw him in there. And he's kind of playing that role ten, twelve, a bit like Jack Crowley is at the moment. I think they just want to get him on the pitch uh, and get him that experience. But he, he's still very young. He's learning his trade a bit. Um, but he looks, he looks like he's going to be the future, future uh, probably starting ten for for Connacht for, for years to come because. Jack, he's done. He's a great servant for for um, Connacht, and I know he's still captain. But he's been struggling a little bit this year and making a few a few errors with it, whether it's misses to touch uh, and his goal kicking hasn't been um, firing on all cylinders. Now that can obviously quickly change around, but when you when that starts to happen, you still start to look at what you what you have below you, and Kaho Ford is is starting to put up his hand. Birch, would it? From an Irish point of view, would it would it be a bit of a concern how how little Bundyaki is is playing? So obviously he had his suspension, which you know that's a concern of on its own. Came back, played the last game against Australia off the bench, but we've only we've only seen him in a few games since he was he was rested again at the weekend. He's we're coming up towards the Six Nations, and he's played three hundred and thirty odd minutes so far this season. Yeah, it is a bit of concern. I didn't, I thought he was very quiet against Ulster. On the twenty third as well, he just didn't impose himself on the game. Um, I, I asked, you know, why he wasn't playing against um against the Sharks, and it wasn't down to to be need to be rested as part of the the national player plan. It was he has a, he had a niggle apparently, and and you know from an Irish point of view, you know Robbie's obviously had an operation. Um, I, I think he's hopefully back, but you know you'd, you'd like to have Bundy and uh, and Robbie. You know, fit and foreign and all cinders as we went to the Six Nations. And for Connor as well, you know, um, he is a, a key man for them. And it's great that Carl Ford um came in and, and, and took his chance. But you would say, you know, Connor are gonna have to make Connor are gonna have to maximize um, you know, the res- the, the fixture list they have and turn those into as many points as they can if they're gonna make that top eight. Um and, and you would feel Bundy getting some regular game time for, for Connacht um is gonna be key to that. Yeah, certainly will. Um, we're running out of time, but Leinster twenty four nineteen winners against the Ospreys, um, certainly not their best performance of the season. Ian, I know they were resting a lot of players as well, but at the end of the day, got out of it with the win. It's thirteen wins or it's fourteen wins out of fourteen in all competitions now. Um, but any any major concern with with the performance, or was it just one of those nights where it was just about getting through and getting the win? Yeah, they struggled up front. Obviously, they're, they're set piece, but they just have a, an unbelievable knack of being able to score at the right time. They scored just before half time. Um, and just it's like they flick a switch when they they feel themselves like like they did against Munster on Stevens' day. They just they just have this ability just to quite right, we need to score next. And they just they just flick a switch and they're they're able to up up a gear. But as I said kind of earlier, the week before Europe. I I always find the Irish promises struggle, and even the the game after um the three interpros because they're such a high level contest. The teams always struggle. Like I I I'd be I'd be worried when once they're, they've got these two European games and then they go over to Benetton. I would be worrying against against Munster against Benetton and that straight after Europe. It's just that that emotional connection with the interpros, that emotional connection with Europe, um. Ireland teams always struggle the week before Europe and the week after Europe. So, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be concerned about that. Lens they're they're still winning and they're not playing well. I think it's, I think they're in a a good place. Um, as as, as compared to to Ulster, they're they're not playing well and losing. So, it's it's good. Yeah. Not First, well was it just was it one of those games really? It just kind of shows up what Leinster have, where struggled their way through through a lot of it, but it was, it was. Two moments of brilliance by two international players in Hugo Keenan and Jimmy O'Brien that just ultimately swung the game in the end. Yeah, and and probably that's the quality they have. Mm. And I thought it was rare for them to look so so disjointed because in fairness, that's what amazes me most about Leinster is their ability to to make so many changes. You know, uh, a lot of weeks of the year and still look like they've been playing together. You know, since they're five or six, and, and that didn't happen at the weekend. And you know the Ospreys found you know some areas of, of dominance, particularly particularly Scrum. Leinster were out of out of their 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 rhythm, 
but yet they have they didn't like obviously don't have all their their big guns, but they're they're you know two of their current internationals. If you say Jimmy Ryan, because obviously he, he featured in November, and Hugo Keenan just were at a different level, and we're able to we're able to just find you know a way to impact the game in a meaningful way. Whereas uh, you know the Ospreys they had some big big names, big experience on the field, but just couldn't find an extra level to put Leinster away, which would have been a a massive season changing result for Ospreys that you felt. Um but they just didn't have the same level of um ability to that Leinster had. And and that's the that's the testament to Leinster as well. Those internationals when they play for Leinster now, they play like it's a an international, you know, um and that's week in, week out. So they're in a they're in a good place, trucking along, still unbeaten, must have 14, 14 wins in a row since the start of the season. Yeah, and all in all, like you mentioned, it would have been a huge win for the Ospreys. And there's a nice competitive balance to the to the table at the moment. And it looks in the, the final third of the regular season, like we're gonna have a, a brilliant scrap for those last couple of of playoff positions and even the permutations of, you know, who's gonna get Champions Cup because you know, you need a Welsh team in the top eight, for example, if if all if all four Irish teams were to to somehow squeeze in there, it's there's a nice little race developing in there in the the final third of the season. Ian. Yeah, there is like Leinster and Stormers are are leading the way, but also kind of drop back into that into that big group of well, from third to ninth to tenth are all quite quite tight around there, and there's a few big games coming up. Um, I think the surprise probably package is is Benetton. I don't think they've lost at home, but they've they they're squeezed up, and then you've got all the the Welsh teams. I don't think is there any of them in the in the top eight or well, no? Cardiff yeah. Cardiff fell out of the top eight. They're down in tenth. But to be honest, there's I mean you're talking a what Edinburgh in eighth position here on on thirty points. There's only a six point gap down as far as the Ospreys in in thirteenth place. So like you're talking a win or two either way is a massive swing. Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? And uh, I suppose that's what. They wanted with the South African teams coming in, and um, I, I, it's it, it's brilliant for the for the competition for growing the sport. And I know everyone talked about the, the South African teams coming in, and should they even be in Europe? But I suppose at the end of the day, it's all about expanding the sport and and, and making it a worldwide um, a worldwide sport that anyone can play. And I think it's 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 great for the competition, and it, it adds a bit of a excitement into. Um, into the into the URC, which I I was playing it for years when I was Celtic League into Magners into Rabo, and I just think it's great that the it, it's developing each year. Yeah, it certainly is nice. Uh, final third of the regular season coming up, but it is uh, Europe this weekend. Gloucester and Leinster is one o'clock on Saturday afternoon. The Champions Cup, Munster and Northampton, three fifteen p.m. That is at uh, Toma Park. In that's also live on RT two and RT player and radio coverage on RT Radio One as well. Uh, also radio commentary of La Rochelle against Ulster that's half past five on Saturday evening and Connacht and Breve are also in action in the Challenge Cup half past five on Saturday add to that as well you've Munster and Leinster 12-15 at Musgrave Park in the Women's Inter-Provincial Championships round two and that's followed by Ulster against Connacht at Kingspan Stadium at half past two and all your energy AIL as well so get it there's if you want to watch a game somewhere in this country there's there's something for you there's there's wall to wall rugby this saturday it seems but um birch ian thanks a million for joining us and uh we'll speak Thank to you, you again soon